was playing in a band with Jeff Horton, Jeff Mark, Pete Holmes, and Mike Lander, Mick Zane from Malice, in the summer of 1981. And we wrote some songs, and I kind of proved myself as a good songwriter, and I had already put a record out, so I had a little experience. And Jeff called me in the fall and said, hey, I got this deal where a studio class, a school at Recording Associates Studio, was having an engineer class, and they needed a real band for the students to practice on. You want to do this? You get a demo for free. And so I said, yeah. So I go over there, and I'm the only guy that has a song. Pete Holmes is on drums. You've seen him in the Geico ads playing drums in the kitchen with Rat lately. And uh, Danny Kurth, who is uh, the bass player for Wild Dogs, and Jeff Mark, the guitarist. These guys had like two full half stacks and two SVT rigs in this basement with a six-foot ceiling. He had to crouch down practically. And thank God we weren't seven feet tall. <laughs> and uh, we fleshed out my tune, Fugitive of the Law, went in, recorded and the studio liked us. Bob Stoutenberg was the engineer, and Jay was the uh, the owner, and he was an instructor. And they wanted us to come back. So we came back in a few weeks, did it, and it came out great. They asked us back for a, another thing. So meanwhile, Pete Holmes joined Black and Blue to play drums, and Jamie, who was the drummer, Jamie St. James, he had no place to go during the day and uh, had no place to store his drums, and so he brought them to Danny's house. He was you know, high school friends with him. And so Jamie started playing drums with us. I had seen Mike Vardy. It's like this fairy tale thing. You watch a TV because you don't work. Then MTV is on. Music television. It was a new thing in 1981. And J.J. Jackson has this guy named Mike Vardy in an interview asking for a band with great guitarists. And we happened to have one and happened to have some songs recorded. We sent him five more songs. And those songs make up half the first Wild Dogs record. I pitched in Life is a Game and Born to Rock. And uh, this was for a compilation record that Mike was putting out. That's what he was looking for bands for. He didn't put out full band albums yet. It was the U.S. Metal series. So we, Mike, they picked us for the U.S. Metal Volume 2 compilation. And also the board, uh, pick Born to Rock, KGO and did. It actually won a contest. So it's kind of like this, you know, fantasy kind of weird like Cinderella story because we weren't planning on being a band so we're getting airplay we're on a record we're getting some write-ups and people are liking us and Jamie St. James left for Hollywood with Black and Blue and so it took both of the drummers we had so we're stuck here in the stump town rainy city of Portland, Oregon and looking for drummers and we tried probably 20 guys they brought their drum kits to Danny's basement. It was really tight to get in there, man. And the way we came up with the name, and because we, we never thought of a name, we never thought of it as a band. So we wrote down these names. I said DMZ because that's kind of punk rocky. And Danny had these two mutts, these two, one was like a part poodle and something else. And another one, they were both blind and they both nipped at your legs when you walked down the stairs. And so I always would refer to them as the wild dogs. And Jeff wrote that down, <laughs> and we just went with it. Kip says, hey, let's go see this guy. Actually, this is right before Mouse moved to Hollywood, and uh, this kid was playing at this club called Eli's, and he was 16 years old, and he was an amazing drummer. Kip had already seen him. Kip Dorn, who was a guitar player for Evil Genius, which we'll talk about a little bit later, my friend from teenage years. Same with Jay Reynolds from Mouse. He was living in my basement right down here. And we went down to see Dean Castronovo and his band called The Enemy. And the guitar player was amazing. I mean, blew our minds. The band was great. Rick Bartell was on Reign of Terror. He was the bass player. And Dean was playing double bass in songs that didn't have double bass, which really made me like them where I didn't like the songs, like Shoot, Shoot by UFO, and singing. And he had a 12 by 12 drum stage. It took up the entire stage. <laughs> he had timpani, he had everything. And so we had, I went to his birthday the next night. He invited me, come on down, man. I'm his 17th birthday tomorrow. And what the real deal was, he needed extra people to help him unload his dad's carpet store truck, this big 20-foot box truck that had all their gear in it. <laughs> so that was my first job for Dean Castronovo, unloading the truck. 
And uh, we got to be friends and stayed in touch. And Jay contacted him to do the Malice demo because uh, he was going to give that to Mike, what's his name? Uh, Brian Slagle from Metal Blade Records to be on their compilation. And so we recorded a few songs of Malice with Kip on guitar, me on bass, and Jay on guitar, and James Neal uh, singing. And uh, Dean didn't want to go to Hollywood with Malice. And so he called us about a month later and said, Hey, man, can I come over and jam with you? And I'm thinking, Why do you want to come and play with us? You got a great band. And uh, I didn't question it. I just wanted to play with him because it was like, you know, it's amazing just to be in the same room with that guy playing drums. And uh, he came over and he completely destroyed Jamie's kit. He broke the. <laughs> he, he had a ghost pedal, it was called a kick drum pedal, that was called the ghost pedal, which had a really heavy duty footboard. He broke that in half. He broke the drum head by kicking it too hard. He broke every head, ruined the cymbals, and Jamie had had this kit forever and <laughs> he used light sticks. He broke all the sticks, and I said, This guy is for us. And Jeff and Danny said, mm, mm, He's too young, he's uncontrollable. <laughs> he, we, we, it was a bad idea. And I said, you don't have any other choice, really. Bryce Van Patten was our only choice, and I love Bryce, but, you know, Dean's got something that uh, you're lucky if you get to play with him. So I talked him into it, and we took Dean, and uh, we went, whew, we did our first gig, and like, well, about nine months later, in San Francisco with Culprit and Mike Barney's band called Cinema, and uh, MTV covered that as a follow-up to the interview that I saw that actually got us in touch with Mike Farney. And culprit, Scott Earl, he invited us to come and play in Seattle two weeks later, and that just kind of kicked off a few years of great gigs. When people knew the songs, and the tape traders had been passing our tape around, and uh, the band kind of made itself. We didn't really do anything. Then it was time to do the second record, Man's Best Friend. And... Uh, well, we were behind because we were playing so many gigs and we're a little short on songs. And so we were using songs that uh, we wrote before we actually got Dean with Neon Drums. And uh, we came up with Man's Best Friend. We tried to record it at Jeff's house in his home studio and it just didn't work out. Mike Varney had just produced this band called Icon and got them signed to Capitol Records. I said, just come on down to Prairie Sun Studio and I'll produce you. I had been in that studio with Kip Doran's band in 1980 when I was going down to Santa Rosa to join his band and uh, recorded at the same studio. The album cover, Man's Best Friend, my wife and I set that up. It was a blue backdrop that Boy George had used a few years, a few weeks ago for a Time Life cover, maybe a couple days ago. I spit blood all over it, fake blood, and uh, <laughs> we made this dog. Mike had us go to this dog training school that was this compound that looked like a, a military place, and these cages where the dogs stayed, and they put us in a couple of the cages with the dogs around us but not near us. And, uh, and these were vicious, like, you know, police dogs, Dober attack dogs. And there was one German Shepherd that was just really nasty. So he stayed outside when we got to Oakland <laughs> to the, do the photo shoot. <laughs> So uh, we're, we put, Angie put foam, it was egg whites, foam, I read, I learned this in theatrics in drama school, and uh, foam and egg whites, and the dog kept trying to lick the carol syrup based blood, and it was uh, really weird. And the trainer, who was on that box, and I put blood on the box, there was some real blood, because the trainer got bit, uh, but for real, by this dog, because he was like, you know, wrestling with him, and uh, what you can't see is a guy off camera holding back this dog. I think you see the chain. But the guy actually got bit, and they took him to the hospital, and uh, it came out great. I love that album cover. And uh, I like photos. I don't like paintings for album covers. So win-win for me for the first album cover. <laughs> we took our promo shot, and we were pressed for time. And I said, you guys, by the time we make a decision, we're going to be 90 years old. That looks like, uh, that shows us black and white cover with all of our spikes and leather and all that stuff, that serves a dual purpose. 
shows what we're about, shows us, let's use that. We'll be done. Now that we had a direction, it was time to figure out how can we improve this? And so the, the weakest link was me because I was a bigger guy. I didn't look like a singer. And for all intents and purposes, I'm not a lead singer. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm an auctioneer. <laughs> and uh, I, I like to do the publicity part of it best. And, uh, you know, I was just trying to find my... I was just living out every fantasy of every singer I ever wanted to be. In fact, one time at a gig in Seattle, I was pretending I was David Lee Roth. I even had the bandanas t- uh, tied around my leg. Somebody threw a bottle of Jack Daniels up on stage, and there's about that much in it. <laughs> so I poured it on me, my head over me, doused me in Jack Daniels, threw the bottle up, it hit the floor. It's a square bottle, remember this. I jump off, and I can't do the splits. <laughs> and... Uh, I came straight down on the bottle of Jack Daniels and twisted my ankle right as the song Evil and Me started, which has a line, whips and chains and baseball bats. I kind of like the pain, as a matter of fact. And I remember singing that. And actually, I have a tape that a guy from Switzerland sent me of that show. And I remember specifically singing, no, I don't like this pain. This hurts like a motherfucker. I finished the song. I finished the actual set. It was in Seattle at Bellevue uh, Community College with uh, Brett Miller's band, Lipstick. And um, I forgot who else was on the bill. But uh, I remember riding home in a backseat of a Capri, a little tiny kind of a sports car, with Kip and his friend. And he, Kip was working for us. And Angie, my, ex, my future ex-wife, who was like six foot three, <laughs> not including her hair. So... <laughs> We're in the back seat of this tiny car going home, and I got to go to the hospital, which I did the next day. And they actually knew me because I wore a Wild Dogs T-shirt, and I, people asked for my autograph. It was, uh, it was a big thing for a few years. So from about 1982 to 1984 and a half, it was a pretty cool thing. We were like the big thing in Portland, Oregon. And uh, then at a meeting with a prospective manager... Now, this is how we met the manager. I was always a publicity guy. And my mom worked at a place that had a print center. I made up these table flyers. We played at the Stone in San Francisco on Broadway. I went around and put these, you know, couple hundred flyers, information sheets on every table. And the place had a lot of tables. And this guy got in touch with me, Ken Mednick. He was a, he worked for Nocturne, which was Journey's lighting company, production company. And he wanted to be a manager. I think what he really did was, I think he liked Dean and had visions of doing something with Dean. And <laughs> funny how Dean ends up playing in two bands, three bands, four bands with Neil Sean and Journey also. So uh, <clears throat> we're having a meeting. I met with him the day before. It was a two-day gig with Night Ranger and Black and Blue at the Keller Theater. The first night, I went down there with Kip. The next night, the rest of the band guys, my guys, Wild Dog guys, comes down to the show. And we don't sit in the same place. We meet up at the stage, backstage door to meet with Ken Bednick, the manager, who I'd met with all day yesterday, day before. And uh, they have this one extra guy. And I introduced myself, and, Hi, how are you? and I just figured they just brought some new guy. Well, it turns out this guy was the new singer, and that's when they told me that they had been they had replaced me, and I didn't realize they had tried a number of people out over the last, like, six months while I was writing the songs for the new Wild Dogs record. <laughs> they were trying out different people, and that's what I found out. And I had had this demo band called Evil Genius. They continued, and uh, I went to Evil Genius, and all the songs that are on the Dr. Mastermind record were fleshed out and recorded with that band. So if you want to flip the page... Go to Evil Genius, and we'll continue the story. I'm Matt McCourt, and you're on usmetal.com. You're never gonna stop.